make Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on Don't forget the popcorn, Frank Coming, dear Now, the hearing officer in making this decision relied on the fact, first of all, relied on the fact that she had said yes to the $10 and said this was a trust that had been funded with $10 in 1981. And also said, I don't believe her as far as the life insurance policies are concerned. She hasn't proved to me that there were no life insurance policies that were contributed in 1981. And remember, when you're applying for mass health, it's always your burden to prove your case. You can't actually document stuff, which is why I always tell people, try to save records. They can assume that the documentation isn't there. So those were the facts, right? And, the, and, and there was a denial. And the attorney was astonished by this denial. And so he appealed to Superior Court and then to the Appeals Court. And the reason for the appeal, next slide, is remember I pointed out that if you have a, a revocable trust, even if you have a revocable trust, if, if the assets that are in the revocable trust can still be reached by the person who is outside of the nursing home, then those assets get counted. Even if there is an irrevocable trust, right? the regulations say that to the extent that the trustee has the discretion, has the discretion, like in this case the daughter, to give assets to, in this case, the mother, the, the trustee is required under Mass Health rules to use her maximum discretion to give as much money as possible to the daughter. Now remember, I told you that back in 1981, the rules of this trust were that following Mr. Victor's death, the trustee could exercise her discretion to give the daughter whatever she needed. To give the daughter whatever she needed, right? Now by the way, back in 1981, it was clear from this decision, those documents weren't structured for mass health purposes. They were structured for tax purposes. And it may very well be that many of you in this room, or some of you, have this very set of documents uh, in which there is a so-called AB trust that gets created. And the reason why these trusts get created are to minimize the possible estate taxes that you might have, or that you might have to pay, or that your kids may have to pay after the two of you have died. And in this case, it was clear, the lawyer in this case said, well, you know, if you do this AB trust, not only can I guarantee that you won't have to pay any estate taxes, but also everything's going to be sell safe for mass health purposes. And the reason is, one, in, at least in Massachusetts, 130 CMR 520.022B1, um, which says that, that, a, a, that all of these rules that I've been talking to you regarding trust uh, apply to, quote, a revocable or irrevocable trust or similar legal, de legal device created or funded by the individual or spouse other than by will. Other than by will. So the whole idea behind the original Frank and Mary scenario that I gave you, where Frank put all the assets into just his name and then specified that upon his death things would go in trust for the benefit of his wife, was among other things in order to make sure that he could benefit from this particular <coughs> section and make sure that the assets that were in that trust weren't going to get evaluated according to the usual mass health rules. That was why he, that was why Frank, among other things, would have done it that way. And that was why this lawyer assumed that, because, that, he, that while the trust was created before um, Mr. Victor died, that because the, all of the money that came into trust really came through his estate as a result of this will, which poured everything into this trust, that therefore this rule was going to apply and it was going to be determined that the assets in that trust were going to be safe as far as mass health was concerned. Next slide. Um, he was wrong um, because the court construed the regulation in an incredibly narrow way. The court said, well, yes, it is true that the, that the statute says that if there is a trust which is created or funded by will, that the usual rules don't apply. We're going to say that this, the fact that this daughter actually got maybe a $10 bill in 1981, even though she probably didn't get any life insurance policies in 1981, meant 
that this trust was already funded with $10. And the mere fact that the other $110,000 that got put into the trust as the result of Mr. Victor's death, right, was vastly more significant than that $10, made no difference. That because there was a pre-existing trust which was funded in any way, with any amount, therefore, all the assets that were in trust were going to be held to the standards of the Mass Health Rules, which meant in this case that because the daughter had the discretion to give the, the, the mother, Mrs. Victor, more than just income, but the discretion to give the mother the principal from the trust, therefore, all of the money was going to be counted. Next slide. Now, I'm going to go to my book. And I, and I know this is a complicated case. And that's why I gave you copies of the case so you can read it. And I'm glad to answer questions on this. I want to, I want to tell you, the court, in making this decision, said this amazing thing right at the beginning. And I just want to read this to you. This is like, I love lawyers sometimes. This is, this is like, this is like the, uh, this is the basic, the, the basic uh, you know, maybe it counts and maybe it doesn't. This is the beginning of the case. Note, <clears throat> decisions issued by the appeals court pursuant to its rule 1.1.28 are primarily addressed to the parties and therefore may not fully address the facts of the case or the panel's decisional rationale. Moreover, rule 1-28 decisions are not circulated to the entire court and therefore represent only the views of the panel that decided the case. So in other words, this case was decided not by all of the judges all at once, but only by three of the judges out of all of the judges, right? A, a summary decision pursuant to this rule, uh, issued after February 28th of 2008, which this does, may be cited for its persuasive value, but because of the limitations noted above, not as a binding precedent. So, the case that I just described to you is not a binding precedent, whatever the hell that means, because it's in all the books and everybody's read it. Right? So, uh, the, 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 my, next slide. So, my general conclusion to all of you is, if you are um, planning for the future, and you have the ability to look at your documents now and make sure that they're right, as opposed to a lot of the people who I talk to who are planning for like a month from now because a disaster has just happened, right? If you're really planning for the future, what I would suggest is, Talk to your lawyer about this if you've got any trust stuff and see if it still works. See if it still works. And if you're wanting to be really conservative, there are a few things that you may want to do. Um, first, there is no question in this case that if Mr. Victor had put into his will all of the testamentary trust provisions which ended up being in this other trust, the 1981 trust, if he had simply put the exact same provisions in his will, and funded everything through his will in 1981, all these assets would have been protected, despite the fact that the trust said exactly the same thing. The only bummer about that is that as a result of that, there would have had to have been a probate of Mr. Victor's will back in 1983, and there would have been some legal costs involved. So the, the most conservative thing to do is to not have any of these other standalone trusts that other assets are going into and simply make sure if one spouse thinks they're going to die and the other spouse may need nursing home care. You simply put all these provisions or these controls right into the will. It's called the testamentary trust. That's the difference between, there are only two kinds of trusts in the world. There are testamentary trusts, that is, trusts that are in the will, and there are inter vivos trusts, that is, everything else. So this would be a testamentary trust. Um, the second thing that you could do, um, and, and by the way, once again, the bad reasons for the testamentary trust, one, is that now you're going to be stuck with probate for sure in the event that you die, because you're going to need to, all of the assets are going to be handled through this trust. And the second thing is, if you're structuring this so that it, af after you die, there's going to be this trust that's going to last as long as your spouse lives, that means that probate's going to be open for a long time, or it might be open for a long time. And every year you have to file a probate accounting, and every year there has to be a review of the numbers. So there's all this legal cost. Now, I'm not sad about that part, but you can be really sad about it. So, so you want to kind of, you want to, you know, you want to weigh out that possibility. A second possibility would be when you are creating these documents, and I know this is something that I'm changing in my documents. Um, 
is you want to specify right in the documents that are being signed. If you're creating this standalone trust into which other assets are going to pour later on, so called pour over trust, you want to say right on, at, up front, nothing is going into this trust. Nothing is going into this trust until the person who's creating it dies. So that it is clear that 100% of the funding that's going into the trust, not the extra $10, 100% of that funding is coming as the result of the will of the person who created this standalone trust. The third possibility is don't leave it, in this case, don't leave it to Mary. You know, if Frank had, if, if despite the, the, the concerns, and you want to talk to your lawyer about kind of weighing out those concerns, about transferring assets directly to your children um, and the exposure that that might cause, that's ultimately the safest way to handle this asset flow. Uh, it, it, it is, it, well, I shouldn't say it's the safest. The testamentary trust is equally safe, but more costly. This is the safest way other than putting it into a testamentary trust to assure in this scenario that all the assets are safe. Once again, I appreciate your um, spending the time listening to all of this. I realize this is just, it's a complicated situation. As you know, this is my goal. Everybody's planning should be about having their own peace of mind. And all, what I'm, all that I'm suggesting to you is if you're in this situation where, the, where there are two spouses that are still alive and you have a concern about if one spouse dies trying to protect all the assets for the other spouse, and, and, and either you've done that kind of planning or you haven't, in either case, you ought to talk to somebody about it. Because if you've already done it, it may be that the planning that you did isn't going to do what you thought it was going to do. Thank you very much.